Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going back and doing another one of those Tech Talk style videos where today we're going to be talking about notch filters. And I know you guys hear me talk a lot about notch filters when I'm, I'm doing upgrades and designing and redesigning products. And, and I, you'll hear me say, well, I had to put a notch filter here on the woofer circuit or a notch filter here to fix this issue. And I have you guys sometimes saying, what the heck is a notch filter? What does that mean? So I have a speaker that was sent in. It was uh, from Chain. And I think it's their 1.5. It's a little bookshelf style speaker. It's got a, a nice looking little paper cone woofer. Actually, it's kind of a heavy, really heavy paper cone woofer. And a pretty cool little planar magnetic tweeter. And it's a perfect example of a in this case, a woofer that really needs a notch filter. So I thought this is a perfect day, perfect example here. We're gonna talk about a notch filter. So a notch filter is a type of filter that's designed to attenuate a peaked up area. And this area, again, it could be in the woofer circuit, it could be in the tweeter circuit, but it's an abnormality in the response where there's an amplitude problem where You'll see in the woofer's response, it'll come up and have a little hump, or sometimes at the end of the woofer's response, there'll be some breakup or something, and you may have to try and put something there to trap it. That's basically what a notch filter does. There's two different types of notch filters. We're going to look at both of them, and some are designed to shunt uh, a certain frequency range back to ground, and some are in line so that they're what they're doing is increasing the resistance to that point, uh, to that frequency range. So we're going to talk about both of those. Let's look at them and let's start with this one. This is what's called a series notch filter. You can see it's three parts. A notch filter always has three parts. It has a capacitor and an inductor and a resistor. And you can put these parts in any order. It doesn't make any difference. It could be like this. You can switch those things around. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And what it's doing is it's allowing whatever will pass through the three to go back to ground. And it's called a series notch filter because they're all in series. Even though, this is kind of tricky, they're in parallel with the driver. So, even though they're in parallel with the driver, all the parts are in series, so it's called a series notch filter. The other type of notch filter is called a parallel notch filter, where all the parts are in parallel, which is also kind of tricky because they're all in series with the driver. So, same thing though, inductor, uh, resistor, and capacitor. And in this case, it's allowing some things to pass through the inductor, some things to pass through the capacitor, and then the resistor is creating a certain amount of resistance within the range that you want to attenuate. They do different things to the impedance, and it depends on the application as to what type of notch filter that you want to look, you want to use. So to start with, let's look at this little woofer's response and see why it is that it needed a notch filter. If you'll notice in the response, the woofer's response starts here and it has a big kind of a broad range hump. And then it carries out there a little further, and then there's a high ringing at the top. There's breakup up at the very top of the woofer's range. Even though this is a paper cone woofer, it's a really stiff cone, and a lot of those heavier stiff materials, or even lightweight stiff materials like metal, metal cones and Kevlar cones and things like that, a lot of times you see the frequency response ramp up at the end, and that's where it's starting to ring. And you have to use it in a in a pass band that's well before that and you have to notch all that out or filter all of it out with the crossover in this case it's right in the pass band the pass band means the band that you're wanting it to pass through so as i looked at this thing i thought it's definitely going to need a notch filter so and in this case i used this type of notch filter it's called a series notch filter so the reason i did that is because there's already going to be an inductor in line with it, and that inductor uh, causes an increase in impedance as frequency increases. So it's making it harder for higher frequency to pass through that inductor. So we already have a range there where the impedance is going up. So this type of notch filter shunts power back to ground and will bring the impedance in that range back down. So it's more ideal for this application. So let's look at what these two different types of notch filters do to the impedance. Um, I did some impedance graphs. We'll start with this type of notch filter here, this series notch filter. 
And if you look at this impedance curve, it looks like this. There's a sharp wedge. And what that's showing is there's an increased amount of resistance in the low frequency range. There's an increased amount of uh, resistance in the high frequency range. And then right where they come together, there's power that'll pass through both of them and it'll go right back to ground. So you see a resistance that's created that looks like this. And then you can go back in with the resistor and change that resistor value to bring that up or down to um, allow you to adjust how much power is shunted back to ground. Now let's look at another one here. This is the same, same style filter, but notice how much broader it is. You can do a broadband uh, notch filter by varying the values here they're still set to where the peak is at the same spot, but instead of it being a narrow band that you're adjusting, you can, uh, you can flare those parts out and allow it to be a wide band. And then, of course, same thing. You start changing the resistors to adjust how much you want to shunt back to ground. Um, on a parallel filter, let's look at the impedance on this one. I set, to, I set a little parallel notch filter together, ran an impedance sweep. It's another tight one. But you see the opposite. You see the impedance look like this. So what's happening here is it's saying, okay, I'm going to allow the low frequency to pass through here. I'm allowing the high frequency to pass through here. So we basically have a short at the lows and a short at the highs. And then in between where they come together, you see this huge peak. And then you go in and you adjust the resistor value to... Uh, bring down the amount of adjustment. You can adjust that with a resistor. Uh, again, here's another one. It's a, it's another notch filter that's adjusted at the same frequency range, but I've spread the um, the values apart so that it's more of a broader range. So it would attenuate a peak that's a broader range peak and not a narrow band peak. So you can adjust those values to make them do whatever you want. And you know, I hate it when I have to do that to, to a speaker. Um, if it were one of our uh, products and and we designed something and we made it and we, we, we got that driver and we tested it and it had that in there, I wouldn't go into production with it. I'd say, no, no, uh-uh. Let's go in and figure out why it's there, what's causing it, and try and resolve it instead of having to throw parts at it later to try and fix it. And unfortunately, I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of speakers come through here where they they design and manufacture the driver, they put it into production, they didn't really do a lot of testing or development with it to see what's going on there, and they didn't even put a notch filter on there to attenuate it, and it's just it's just a lump there. So um, I hate it when I see that stuff coming in, but it is fixable, and it, usually it's cheaper to figure out what's causing it within the driver and solve it than to spend the money on additional parts trying to fix it. So. Let's look now at this little speaker and see what it looked like when it came in and what I had to do to it and how it ended up and what happens when you put that notch filter in one. Let's look too at the tweeter's response. Um, this is that little planar magnetic tweeter. And if you look at the response, it's, it plays pretty loud it, at the highest frequency range. And then it has a, just a slope. As it goes lower in frequency range, the output on it drops quite a bit. If you look at the overlay of the tweeter and the woofer, you notice that the tweeter level is way above the woofer level. So it had to be pulled down to that level in order to create a balanced response. Well, let's look at the frequency response of the speaker as it came in. And if you look at the, the measured response, you'll notice there's that little humped up area. You know, just, just putting a uh, an inductor on it to pull it down didn't get rid of it. It's still a bright area there. You can see it around uh, seven to eight hundred hertz is where it peaks, and then right after that, approaching two k hertz, you'll see a big dip in the response there. So, it's a pretty uneven response. You can see it also in the spectral decay. The spectral decay is fairly clean. There's a few ridge lines there. Some of it could be um, not enough insulation in the box. Some of it's from that little peak in the roofer's response. Um, but overall, I'm not seeing a lot of stored energy and ringing in the final product. Not not bad. Not like I see in a lot of other speakers. If you look at the horizontal off-axis, it looks just like the vertical off. I mean, just like the on-axis response, uh, and it just drops off as you go further off-axis. If you look at the vertical off-axis, and again, vertical off-axis 
is changing the time arrival of the speaker of the drivers. We're going up in most cases, and then we're, sometimes we go down also to see where they're more in phase. And as you go up, you can see the time arrival of the drivers change, and you see a deeper hole where there's already a hole there. You see it drop out quite a bit. And so they're starting to become more out of phase. And as you go up in frequency, there's just a big hole in the response. So let's look at what I managed to do with this thing. Here's the new frequency response. Notice it's now it's much smoother. In fact, it's, ex it's extremely smooth. It's within about a dB and a quarter or so all the way across. If you look, though, at the woofer's response, you'll see uh, there's, there was that little peak at 700 to 800 hertz. We've pulled that down to where it's level, and we could have pulled it down even further, but as we pull it down a little further, there's a little dipped area right before it that would come down with it. So what we had to do is kind of balance that out and try to make a smoother response out of it as possible. Notice the tweeter's response now, super smooth, just nice, smooth cascade over into the woofer's response. The only problem with this little tweeter, it doesn't play down very low. So you can't expect low crossover points. That's another reason in the vertical off axis that they become out of phase because at the higher crossover points, the wavelengths are a lot shorter. And the shorter the wavelengths, the less you have to move one distance in relation to the other before one's out of phase with the other. So that's just the way it is. Um, let's check out the new spectral decay. Super clean now, much cleaner than it was. A lot of that little ringiness is gone. There's still a little bit there down low which is just probably indicative of us not putting enough stuff in, in the box to find where optimal was. If we started playing with that a little bit, a little of that down low would go away. Um, the horizontal off axis, again, looks good. It's, um, it drops off pretty evenly. And the vertical off axis now, same measurements as you go up and down, uh, not near the hole. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of a dropout in the, in the response, and that's because the, the crossover frequency is fairly high again because the tweeter doesn't play down very low. I didn't mention before the impedance response. Uh, nothing really special going on there. They did a good job on the tweeter end. They used a little more resistance um, in shunt than in line. It dropped down to 4.6 ohms. When I put resistor values on it, I balanced that a little more. So we're about six ohms straight across. Um, easy loads, uh, worked out really well. This is not a speaker that there are tons of out there. I don't expect a bunch of you guys are all going to say, hey, I've got that speaker. Uh, I would like to order an upgrade for that thing. So it, probably not going to put it on our site, but um, if you're interested in it, give me a call. I've got a total for all that stuff here. It was $205 worth of parts, $14 worth of new wiring, a set of tube connectors, and one sheet of no res to help with the ringing of this box. Uh, the tube connectors are going to replace... The cheesy binding posts on the back, which were ferromagnetic, which was not good. Uh, it does have a port plug. I didn't mention that. It came with that little plug, so you can plug the port or open the port. Um, the box looked fairly nice as far as, I don't know if this was a, a veneer or what. I didn't really examine it super close, but I don't like the sharp edges. That always causes a little diffraction, but overall it, it looked nice. And after we implemented this new set of parts, it measured really well, and I'm sure... Probably going to sound great too. Uh, there's a huge upgrade in parts quality. If you see inside there, what was in there, it was a bunch of cheesy stuff in there. That's what's in there. There was uh, iron core inductors. There's an electrolytic cap on the woofer circuit. Uh, there was a little poly cap on the tweeter circuit and an L pad, some very small resistors. I don't know how well you guys can see it in there, but um, it's the cheap stuff. So uh, the upgrade includes much higher quality parts. It should turn this into something even with the notch filter, which in this case looked like this, that fixed the woofer's response. So if you guys have any more questions about notch filters or something else, uh, drop them in the comments section. And I hope you guys learned something about notch filters. See you guys in the next video.